welcome. Welcome to another uh, City Club Friday Forum. I'm Doug Marker, President-Elect of the City Club. Our program today is growing consensus on full debt cancellation, why it makes sense. Um, first, a few announcements, and please, if you would uh, remember to turn down your cell phones and paging devices, we'd appreciate it. Um, next Friday's forum, May 6th, is Tech Equity, Social Impact Through Access to Technology. Our speakers will be Nigel Ballard, um, Director of the Personal Telco Project, Oso Martin, Founder and Outreach um, of Free Geek, Arturo um, Velasenor, Access Technology Coordinator for Central Cultural of Washington County. Some events coming up at the City Club include, um, today is our final Friday open house, 4.30 to 6 um, p.m. Um, at the City Club Commons, just over here on 9th and Washington. We'll have a cash bar. And um, we'll be doing a, a very short introduction and orientation to the City Club's web blog for those of you who want to learn how to blog with the best of them. Um, next week, um, we'll also be holding an important Portland School Board candidate forum on Thursday, May 5th, co-sponsored by the club by the Portland Business Alliance and the Portland School Foundation. That, that will be free and open to the public, 7.30 to 9 a.m. here at the Governor Hotel. Um, for our friends um, at the World Affairs Council, I'd also like to um, announce their monthly head, headline forum, Third World Imperative, Saving the Children, with Jennifer Fro um, Freustad, um, Director of Save the Children. And that'll be Tuesday, May 17th to, um, at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Multnomah Athletic Club. Admission is $5 for uh, World Affairs Council members and $10 for guests. Details on all these events and membership can be found on the club's website at www.pdxcityclub.org. Um, today's program, first of all, I'd like to thank the co-sponsorship of our friends at the World Affairs Council and Mercy Corps for co-sponsoring um, our program. Our sponsors, um, who are invaluable in ensuring the broadcast of the City Club programs uh, this quarter, are Pope and Talbot Incorporated, Providence Health Systems, and Zimmer Gun Frasca. Would you please join me in thanking our sponsors? <laughs> to today's program, many people know what it's like, uh, what it feels like to owe money, um, even if just uh, for a mortgage or a car payment. But it's a different matter to be to get, uh, different matter altogether to be deeply in debt and unable to make the payments. And it's particularly onerous if you weren't the ones who incurred the debt originally. In personal finance, there's a concept of bankruptcy um, that uh, pre prevents people from being held to debt that is unsustainable. But there is no such concept in international finance. And many of the world's poorest countries are now in, uh, captured by debt that. Uh, is crippling for those countries to pay and prevents them from addressing important um, crises of um, health care and education. Our speakers today are engaged in the Jubilee Campaign for International Debt Relief. Our first speaker will be Jonah Gokova from Zimbabwe. Mr. Gokova chairs the Zimbabwe Coalition on Debt and Development and serves as the coordinator of the Ecumenical Support Services in Zimbabwe. He is a leading organizer and activist on uh, campaigns for international debt relief and issues of gender violence. Ana Maria Nemenso from the Philippines is the president of the Freedom From Debt Coalition in the Philippines. She is a writer and frequent commentator on debt and economic justice in the Philippines. Neil Watkins of Washington, D.C. is the national coordinator of the Jubilee USA Network. Watkins co-founded and coordinated the World Bank Bonds Boycott at the Center for Economic Justice. Uh, we'll uh, hear from each of these speakers on this important topic and then open the, uh, open the forum for questions. So, Mr. Gokova. Well, I'm very happy to be here and I thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share our experience of what it means to live in a country that is in a debt trap or a debt crisis. We live in a world where we see the increasing shift of resources and wealth from the rich, from the poor to the rich, and this is happening at local country levels 
This is happening at regional levels. This is also happening at global level. In countries that have gone through the structural adjustment programs imposed by the IMF and the IMF, which is International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, we have what we now refer to as the new poor. These are people who were employed previously, but they've lost their jobs since the intro as a result of the introduction of structural adjustment programs. So poverty is on the increase. People who used to hold jobs have now lost them. And as a result, have also been kicked out of homes and they are now in the streets or living in slums. Africa has got over 30 countries that have implemented the structural adjustment programs. These are programs that were introduced by the World Bank and the IMF with the intention of assisting countries to be able to repay their debts. But these institutions have left us in a worse situation than we were before. I want to share with you some statistics regarding what I'm actually talking about in terms of why this debt situation has become a crisis. For every one dollar owed by developing countries in 1980, we have since paid $7.5. And we are still being told that we owe, still owe $4. Within the last 30 years, Africa has borrowed $540 billion. We have since repaid $550 billion. We are still being told we owe $300 billion. So when we're talking about debt issue, the debt crisis or the debt trap, it really for us becomes a matter of life and death. The money that we're paying is coming from the pockets of people who are already impoverished, who are living in poverty. As a result, these people are now unable to access health delivery systems. They are now unable to send children to school and to enjoy social services. So it is important for us to address this issue because we're saying it has ceased to be just an economic issue. It has ceased to be just an, 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 an monetary arrangement issue it is also becoming very much a moral issue, which requires the attention of every concerned citizen of the world. This is why we're calling for total, unconditional debt cancellation. And we are saying, this should happen now. We would like the IMF, the World Bank, the US Treasury, the G7 countries to agree with us that the route that we have taken that has put us in a debt trap is unsustainable if we want to talk about sustainable development. And we need to immediately engage in reverse gear. And the way to do it is to effect complete 100% total unconditional debt cancellation. Those who continue to demand that we repay the debts fail to consider or even care for the pressing human needs that are on the ground. 
with the increasing levels of poverty, there is no way we are now able to pay the debt. That is why Nyerere asked the question, shall we allow our children to suffer so that we can pay the debt? But also, if you look at the figures that I've given, it is clear that we have paid our whatever we are being told we owe over and over again. And what we are now being required to pay is just interest that is accumulated. It has become almost just speculative money that we have to continue to pay. And now we are confronted with not only economic challenges, but also moral challenges. Africa needs something like $15 billion per year to address the problem and the challenge of HIV and AIDS. Africa is paying something like 13 billion per year in debt service. And what we're saying is that when you're talking about the debt trap, we're having resources that we are transferring from the poor people in developing countries to the rich elites in developed countries. And that money could be used to resource development programs that will benefit our people. That money could be used to fight the problem of HIV and AIDS, but we're being forced to take that money out of the hands of the poor into the pockets of the rich. It, is, it becomes a big dilemma for us. We're now talking about making choices between supporting people's lives or increasing the profits of banks that are unaccountable to the people, that are secretive in terms of what they're earning and what they're spending that money on. And what we need is to begin to consider the needs of the people before we talk about profits. Debt for us, even debt repayment, is no longer something that we see as an alternative. We need to move from a situation where we force people to pay these so-called debts and begin to unlock those resources by canceling the debts so that those resources can be available to support people's lives. Instead of this increased competition that we see, we are saying we need to encourage more cooperation. Instead of supporting policies that marginalize people, we need to promote solidarity among the people. This is probably also one of the reasons why we're here. People's lives are at stake, and this becomes a challenge for everyone, every citizen of the world. There is no way one should say, well, because it is not happening in the States, it's happening elsewhere, I'm not involved. Because there is also a way in which we are very interrelated and we depend on each other. So this challenge is something that we all have to consider. Shall we continue to support the profit motive or shall we make a decision to begin to give the poor people of the world a new start? And that is the challenge that we have. Thank you.
their friends, uh, like uh, Jonah and Neil, who are very happy to be with you today. Particularly in my case, I think it's a kind of a homecoming because my father graduated from the University of Oregon. So in a sense, I have that kind of affiliation with the state of Oregon. But the topic today that we are uh, sharing with you is not a happy one for us. It's the problem of debt. It's the burden of debt. And if I can just give you some idea of, of how heavy it has fallen on the shoulders of people, we probably started with $28 billion when we got rid of the Marcos dictatorship, the martial law regime. Now it's $107 billion. And it is a debt burden that is prioritized, debt payments for which uh, is prioritized over any other single expenditure of government. As we have heard from Jonna, this involves this compromises uh, expenditures for housing, for health, for education, and it compromises the development of our economies to sustain people and livelihood and lives. That payment uh, alone for this coming year is going to take up 95% of tax revenues that we can expect. What that gives you, I think, an idea of what is left uh, to pay for other expenses. So this debt burden has become worse over the years. And with all the aid borrowings uh, that have been extended to us with the idea that uh, this was uh, going to solve poverty, it has not. It has buried us further in debt. Health expenditure last year amounted to only less than one cent per person per day. It has gotten that bad that it has become intolerable, and yet, until very recently, International financial institutions, even our own government, said that the debt was sustainable. And yet I heard earlier that there's no such thing as sustainable debt. They meant it was sustainable, it was manageable, because there, were, there was credit that, was, uh, that creditors were still willing to extend further uh, uh, lending to us. So when will this stop? And when is this cycle of indebtedness and the need for borrowing going to stop? So we look at the uh, problem of debt, not only in legal terms, not only according to you know, figures like how much was borrowed and how much has to be paid, because it seems that creditors are just concerned with that and do not consider the impact of the debt, of the borrowings on the lives of people. And we need to see this, as we have realized, to see this in a historical, political, social, as well as economic aspect, considerations. We have to consider all these. And when we look at the state of the need for borrowing, we trace this to a history of colonization that has placed us at the time that we were supposed to be independent and free, still in a state of underdevelopment, of poverty, of economic and trading relations that continued to be tied to the economies, to the trade uh, necessities of the industrialized countries and of the United States. So this created that need for borrowing that went on over the years. 
Another is that the debt has become also an instrument by which creditors, uh, uh, credit institutions have imposed uh, conditionalities on our people. I think you have all heard of the structural adjustment policies, which uh, many, many studies have shown have not really um, reorganized and made more efficient economies that were placed under those programs. We look at also how debt has, uh, has been contracted through illicit, questionable, fraudulent ways. And, and we say in terms, under terms that were grossly disadvantageous to our people. Um, and we see how, how this debt burden has been um, shouldered by and passed on, actually, who pays for the debt if not ordinary people through their taxes. And when they see that it's this debt, the, the loans that were incurred were not used to improve the conditions of life, to, to provide housing and health care and education, when they see that loans that were extended went to the pockets of dictators, of repressive, re repressive regimes. In our particular case, during the martial law period, the loans were mostly, uh, 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 benef uh, mostly benefited the dictator as well as his cronies. So these are, were loans that were contracted, that were borrowed in, in our name passed on to the people to be paid by them, and yet did not result in any improvement in their lives. So these are the many, many ways by which one should try to understand the whole debt burden, the, 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 the creation of the need for borrowing, and the continuous extension of the loans and credit with which to bury us further into debt, and the cycle must stop. We feel that this compromises our country's capacity to undertake any uh, uh, kind of uh, development program that will sustain services for the people. It compromises also the health and lives, as you must have uh, realized, of our people, particularly when countries like ours or countries in, in, other par in, in the uh, regions of the world where you find the poorest people and you have natural disasters happening, just like uh, towards the end of last year we, and with the tsunami tragedy, when you think that Without those natural disasters, it was already a very great burden, a very great obstacle to overcome you know, the problems of poverty and underdevelopment. When you think that with the natural disasters happening, you can just imagine that development of, 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 you know, a, will, will be set back many, many years, and the humanitarian aid that has come around, most welcome, but you think of six to seven billion dollars that have been collected, probably increasing, but when you look at the debt payments that, the, that are taken from the South of about 23 billion dollars, the humanitarian aid is a pittance, doesn't mean much. And it will never get people, it will probably save temporarily some lives, but it can never, never get them out of a life of indebtedness and poverty. So for all these reasons, we have come to you to seek your support in a campaign to cancel the debt and to start anew and in a way, you know, a kind of reparation for all the things that have happened in the past. 
not uh, in our intention, certainly, but a way of writing what, is, what was wrong, what was not fair, so that we can all try to restructure our lives, restructure a better world, so that all of us, you in the advanced, advanced industrialized countries, as well as peoples of the South, can live with freedom and dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to say thanks again to the City Club for this opportunity. And though I think many see rightfully that the crisis of international debt is an international issue, that there are really strong links to um, issues that we're facing here in the United States and even here in Oregon. If you hear some of the stories, for instance, about privatization or these structural adjustment programs in Asia and Africa, that some of these struggles around, for example, the power sector about the impact of privatization in that sector, I think, do affect us right here. So it's not only, I think, for us in Jubilee USA, it's clear that this is not only an issue of solidarity with people in Asia and Africa and Latin America, but also fundamentally an issue that we in our own country are dealing with. I want to just say that Jubilee USA Network um, here in the US is a network of about 70 organizations, uh, including um, faith-based organizations, labor, environment, human rights, and community groups across the country. And we're really um, honored to be here as part of a, uh, a tour across the country to bring these stories that you've heard from Anna Maria and Jonah uh, to people here in the United States. And we engage, in addition to events like this, public education, um, campaigns, as well as legislative advocacy in Washington to try to influence our elected officials to take action on the crisis of international debt. And I want to speak briefly to you about um, the title of the event today, The Growing Consensus on Full Debt Cancellation. Um, if, if you came to this issue about 10 years ago, uh, and, and many of us and many organizations had started working on this issue 10 years ago, uh, people in Washington or people at the World Bank or IMF, if you came to them and said, let us cancel the debt of the third world, people would sort of laugh or scoff. It's sort of a crazy idea, a radical idea. But people kept at it. And over the past 10 years, we have seen that this issue has gotten some significant attention. People might have heard of the Jubilee 2000 campaign, which leading into the year 2000 brought people of faith and conscience around the world into a global campaign to pressure the G8, the wealthiest nations in the world, to take action um, in a small, limited way. But they did take action for debt relief. Um, in 1999, the G8 promised to cancel $100 billion in debt. Uh, they have not yet uh, fully canceled that amount. We have seen about $50 billion in debt cancellation, but it certainly was a, a small first step. Our own government, under pressure from Jubilee and others, canceled a lot of the debt, or 100% of the debt, that the poorest nations owe the United States. But they only took a small step to cancel what is the greatest burden that the impoverished nations face, and that is debt owed, as you heard from Jonah and Anna Maria, to the IMF and the World Bank. The IMF and World Bank have an initiative called the Heavily Indebted Poor Countries Initiative, which has provided, again, limited debt relief for about 27 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And one thing we can say about this program is that it has shown that debt relief can work, that the money that has been released from debt relief has been used for health care, for education, for clean water. Um, but the HIPAA initiative hasn't gone far enough. Our argument is that it has been too, too little relief for too few countries and too many of these structural adjustment conditions that you have heard about. So since 2001, we in Jubilee USA have been making a prophetic call um, to our own government and to the rich nations and the IMF and World Bank. We think there should be 100% multilateral debt cancellation for all impoverished countries. That if countries are to have any hope of meeting the Millennium Development Goals, the, the goals agreed by world leaders to have world poverty by 2015, that full debt cancellation is a critical first step. That if we were to have any hope of trying to stop the devastating pandemic of HIV AIDS, that full debt cancellation is absolutely critical. So leading, we've been camp campaigning with this message for a number of years, and last year we actually um, can celebrate a small step forward. The United States government and the current Bush administration and announced that it had a policy as well. It supports 100% multilateral debt relief. 
Now, their policy uh, has, is not as bold as we would like it to be. It is for, again, just 27 countries. It is only for one type of creditor, the World Bank. But we think that it is an important step forward, and we are working to push our government to be even stronger in its position. I think it's important to note that the issue of debt cancellation is not a partisan issue. It is not an ideological issue. That the issue really enjoys bipartisan and cross-ideological support. Our champions are range from Rick Santorum, a senator from Pennsylvania who is fairly conservative, to Maxine Waters, one of the most liberal members of the House of Representatives from California. Um, so I think this is an issue which does transcend those normal divides, and part of that is because the, the concept of Jubilee is, is a biblical notion. It is not purely, uh, this is not a purely a faith-based movement, but a lot of its roots um, come from, um, from the Bible and this idea that every seven years that nations and people should see their debts canceled, and that we're trying to apply that biblical concept to an important current problem. Right now, there are discussions on debt cancellation at the highest levels. Um, the G8 nations meet once a year in a summit. This year's summit will be in Glen Eagle, Scotland. It's hosted by the United Kingdom. And debt cancellation will be on these leaders' agenda. Again, thanks to, to, to people around the world that have been pressing on this issue for many years. But they have been dragging their feet, and they haven't been, uh, they have not yet agreed on how much debt cancellation, on even whether to do it. So we are now trying to generate the political will to make sure that there is a strong and bold deal this summer at the G8 for debt cancellation. I often get the question, what would be the cost to the U.S. economy of canceling debt? Wouldn't this be expensive? Would this hurt our economy? Well, just to give some numbers, even if you look at the 42 countries, even just the 42 countries, we call for more countries than this to be part of debt cancellation. But it would cost the IMF just $8 billion, and it would cost the World Bank $23 billion to cancel fully the debts of those 42 poorest countries. The IMF has billions of dollars worth of gold that which, which it holds on its books at one-eighth of the world price of gold. We think a responsible sale of that gold could go a long way to raising resources for debt cancellation. And even beside the point, what is the cost, we ask, of not acting? The cost of not providing life-saving debt cancellation for people across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. I want to end by offering um, some ideas for what people can do if you've been moved by the stories from Jonah and Anna Maria if you feel that this is something that is important and you can join with us in these critical months leading up to the G8 Summit. First, you can join with Jubilee Oregon. Jubilee USA Network has a chapter here in Oregon which is strong and thriving. Um, and you can find a table here at the City Club. Um, you can also sign a postcard. We have launched a campaign called Wipe Out Debt in 2005. And our goal is to deliver um, more than 15,000 of these postcards to President Bush before he leaves for the Glen Eagles G8 Summit in early July. So if you'd like to sign a postcard and you're with us here today, you can go to the Jubilee table in the back, or you can also get them online on our website at www.jubileeusa.org. Um, there's also an initiative which we are supporting in Congress. Again, this is an issue which has um, gotten the attention of legislative officials in our country as well. And there's a bill called the Jubilee Act, um, which is a bipartisan bill supported by, um, again, liberal Democrats like Maxine Waters and Barney Frank, but also supported by uh, conservatives like um, Spencer Baucus from Alabama and Jim Leach from Iowa. And the bill calls for 100% multilateral debt cancellation for 50 countries, and it includes countries that aren't part of the heavily indebted poor countries initiative, such as Nigeria such as Haiti, such as Jamaica. These are countries which have not yet received debt relief. But these are countries struggling with poverty, struggling with the pandemic of HIV AIDS, and we think it's critical that, that, they, be, that they also be part of this, this process on debt cancellation. So I want to just conclude by kind of beginning where I started, which is to say that um, this issue is not just a, an issue out there. I think that the issue of international debt and globalization are very related and that we in the United States certainly have a duty as one of the, uh, as, as the, perhaps the, the single superpower in the world to influence our government, which has tremendous influence over the, the policies of debt in the IMF and World Bank. But it's also in our interest. 
I think if we look at the impact of globalization and trade on our own economy here in Oregon and on our economy where I'm from back on the East Coast, that these are issues that we have to grapple with from our own perspective as well. And that um, I hope that, that all of us, based on this spirit of jubilee, of building right relationships between nations, that, that, that the, one of the ideas that we are bringing forward is that um, in, order to, in order to address this crisis of debt, this is fundamentally an issue of broken relationships between countries. And the Jubilee is about beginning to restore relationships so that we can deal with other nations in a respectful and honorable way. And I ask that you join with us and let us work together to break the chains of debt. Thank you. Thank you. It's um, time for questions for our speakers, and uh, if you'll come to the microphone up here at front to ask your questions. Questions are a privilege of membership of the City Club, but today um, we extend that privilege to our um, friends of the World Affairs Council and the Mercy Corps. Uh, our first question will come from Andy Linehan. Andy's immediate past president of the City Club, and he's Wind Energy Permitting Director for the Scottish Power PPP. PPM Energy. Andy's also a former Peace Corps volunteer in Mauritania. Andy? I want to thank our wonderful panel here today. Um, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I thought a lot about development and was observing uh, these IMF and World Bank and USAID programs, which were uh, investing money in the country where I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And at the time, this was a long, long time ago, of course, uh, the assumption was, and then the reason for these, these loans, was to make investments to alleviate poverty and to start third world countries onto a, a path of prosperity. Well, clearly that has not worked, at least that's what we're hearing from our panel that that's not worked. So my question would be, if debts were erased, what model would you believe should be the model for, for development in the, in the third world? What should be, we be doing differently to prevent this situation from recurring? And I'm, I'm directing this to anyone on the panel who'd like to uh, comment on that. question was uh, um, how would the, we use the, the release? What's the, the new model that just hasn't worked? What, what? Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to say, you know, at, at this point, uh, just exactly what model. Um, certainly, um, I think initially, uh, the, the government um, should assume, you know, greater uh, role in uh, providing for basic uh, social services. In, in a country that's com you know, very poor, uh, we need um, a, a structure uh, which government has that can uh, deliver services to all. We cannot just leave it you know, at, at the start to, uh, to small uh, uh, community groups. Although we do promote the, uh, the uh, notion of community self-reliance, but there is, there's just that basic social, social services like education, like health care, like housing, like public utilities of uh, infrastructure development and even uh, water and uh, electricity. I think this has got to be uh, provided by government. And later on, we'll see how, how this uh, develops further. But we are not just about to copy you know, and imitate any model. I think we will have to define that according to our needs and according to a democratic process in which everything should be transparent, uh, information is available, and people are able to participate in the strategic decisions that affect uh, them all. Bill Savage. This is on. Bill Savage, City Club member. Um, uh, actually, a couple questions, if I may. First is, who, the, who are the creditors? IMF and World Bank, for sure, but are there countries, like this government of the United States land, and, and, or, or banks? Um, does, do major banks land. And then secondly, I, I'd appreciate if somebody could talk about the structural, what do you call it, the uh, structural adjustment 
Um, as I was looking at, has been reading about Zambia, and they, they're having some of their debt forgiven. And it seemed like one of the requirements was a, um, that they set up a program to deal with poverty, which seems on the surface to make sense, but I don't know. Um, so I appreciate if you could address those two questions. Thank you. So maybe I'll start, and then um, Jonah and Maria can certainly add. I think the question of who are the creditors is an important one. To, there are three main creditors of um, third world debt. Multilateral, these are institutions like the IMF and World Bank. Um, bilateral creditors, so our own government, other European or Japanese governments, and then private creditors, banks like Citibank and others. For the most impoverished countries, um, multilateral creditors are the most significant uh, creditor. Um, partially that's because very poor countries don't have access to private credit. Citibank doesn't want to make loans to those countries. So um, that is why, at least at this point, our focus has been on multilateral debt cancellation, though we also um, work on these other types of, of debt. Um, the bilateral debt, as I mentioned, some bilateral debt to some countries was canceled by G7 nations in 1999 under pressure from the, G7, uh, from the Jubilee campaign. Um, but that doesn't apply to all countries. Countries like Nigeria, um, again, extremely poor, has a, a tremendous problem with HIV AIDS, has a huge bilateral debt burden um, to the U.S. and other uh, governments. And then finally, private creditors, and this is probably an issue that Anna Maria can address better, but um, middle-income countries, so-called middle-income countries, like the Philippines, like Brazil, like South Africa, a lot of their debt is private. Um, Argentina, which recently, if people follow the news, actually um, partially defaulted to some of its creditors um, and only paid its bondholders back about a third of what, of what they were promised. So it really depends on the, the, the type of country um, that, that you're looking at to see what, their, what their, their creditor debt profile is. I don't know if someone else wants to tackle the structural adjustment question. In, in fact, what has happened was, is that uh, the organizations like uh, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have come back to our countries and said, because you owe us money, we're going to introduce very stringent measures that you must follow for a certain period of time, and then everything will be OK. So if you're talking about structural adjustment programs, those are part of the stringent me measures. It's a set of stringent measures that say, don't invest in, um, in uh, health, education, and, and so on and so forth. If these people want to pay, then they must pay what they call user fees. Um, another set of uh, stringent measures is what is called the HIPIC. Um, um, they, they had about uh, um, a number of countries that they picked up and said, these are the high heavily indebted countries. And they worked out a set of measures that they required these countries to implement. Um, but they've actually done that again without uh, any meaningful change that uh, we can show uh, for, 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 for those programs. Of late, they are introducing what they call the poverty reduction uh, programs that they are also requiring countries to implement. But the story is the same. And so we see these as what we refer to as conditionalities. And we are beginning to reject these conditionalities, conditionalities because they are not delivering. I think I want to ask a question about conditions. Um, let's see. Um, after World War I, uh, reparations were visited upon Germany, and it was pretty well recognized by the international community that it was a major contributor to World War II. And I'm wondering if maybe that's what the international community has to realize, is that this is simply burdening countries with um, a situation whereby no good can come of it. Uh, would it be feasible to, in a sense, say, for old debt, we won't, we will simply forgive unconditionally, as you suggested, Mr. Gokova. But for new debt, that is, new loans and such, that there would be conditions 
so that we don't end up with either money in Swiss bank accounts or glorious um, international airports and people who are still not getting health care and education. <clears throat> Um, definitely. Well, but these are terms that should be negotiated, you know, uh, between uh, two countries, not, not simply uh, imposed. Um, we ourselves in, in, in the Philippines, uh, in, in waging our campaign for total and unconditional uh, cancellation of the debt, uh, also want our own government to be, to, uh, to be open accountable and responsible. So uh, we have also proposed that uh, there should be an official uh, inquiry, investigation, and audit of the debt. Because we have to know just what debts were incurred. And it's not just a matter of figures, how much was owed and how much uh, should we pay back. But we should also look at the nature of the debt the, the terms, the conditions, the processes the, uh, that uh, were used, and also the impact of, of the debt. And, and uh, luckily, fortunately, we have found sympathetic ear among um, our, some of our legislators, and they have proposed this uh, resolution in both houses of Congress, uh, call, uh, creating a congressional commission on the debt audit. And uh, if this passes the Senate, then we're off to a good start. Because I think that we need to get full information about the whole impact and the problem of the debt. But we're not just leaving it to the official inquiry. We are also mobilizing a citizen's debt audit process so that we can continue to participate and to act as a, uh, a monitoring body, and that we, we have uh, asserted that all this inquiry and investigation cannot just remain you know, at the top, that they should listen to people's testimonies to, to get a fuller picture of the debt problem. So certainly, this is supposed to come up with policy recommendations on how to conduct future borrowings. We are not saying we will not borrow anymore, but that there should be clear rules to guide, you know, our borrowings in the future, because so often uh, all these um, negotiations have been done in secrecy only by the executive department, and no other body has been able to check, you know, um, how this goes on. Carol Witherell, City Club member. Thank you. How can we best participate in legislative advocacy? And is there anyone connected with our um, current Washington administration who understands the importance of debt cancellation for world stability and sustainability of all kinds, environmental, economic, social, political? Well, um, there are a number of ways people can get involved, I think. Um, as I mentioned, the, there is a piece of legislation now in the House of Representatives uh, called the Jubilee Act, which would provide, uh, which calls, basically would urge the Treasury Department to negotiate in the IMF and World Bank for those institutions to provide 100% debt cancellation. Um, and that act, uh, it's H.R. 1130, um, it currently has uh, about 60 congressional co-sponsors, um, including uh, Earl Blumenauer here in Oregon, but we're working on other uh, trying to encourage all members uh, to support it. And again, this is a bipartisan initiative that we have seen support uh, for the concept of debt relief across the aisle, and we're really trying to encourage that. And I, th and I think it is encouraging that uh, the Bush administration has also at least been talking about doing more on multilateral debt relief. And our challenge now is to move that sort of rhetoric into actual action, and, and the time for that action is um, this July um, at the G8 summit. I think one other thing that is important to address in the congressional context, one of the debates right now over debt cancellation is how to pay for it and how to finance this. Um, and this, this is a, could be, I, I think our colleagues across Asia, African America, uh, Africa, and Latin America 
see this as a bit of a, a difficult thing that, that rich nations are squabbling basically over to how to find a fairly small amount of money uh, to cancel uh, impoverished country debt, which would make a huge impact. But regardless, they've been dithering over this. And one of the most important possible sources of financing is the IMF's gold. The IMF has had gold since um, the, the world was on a gold standard, um, but we no longer are. Um, so the IMF has about 100 million ounces of gold, um, again, which it values at just a mere percentage of the world price of gold right now. And the IMF itself actually came out with a report about two weeks ago, which said that it could sell gold responsibly on the world market without any impact on gold price. So that is to say, it could use what's called the central bank gold agreement, um, which exists among European central banks, and not introduce any new gold onto the market. So um, th the reason this is important is that right now the gold industry um, has been lobbying senators and members of the House of Representatives to oppose the sale of IMF gold to finance debt cancellation. So we're trying to get out the word that um, we think it's important that this is a source of finance that could really resolve some of the debates about how to pay for debt cancellation. So um, being in touch with our um, elected officials to educate them about um, the, the, really this, this issue of gold would not affect the world price, and this would not affect the gold industry, but could really provide the resources to, to provide this life-saving relief. Good morning. I'm uh, Peter Fenner, a member of the City Club. Uh, my question is probably to Joanna and maybe Anna Marie. Uh, you may have answered it to a, 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 a piece a minute ago, but the, the real question is, how to break this chain that uh, <clears throat> Neil was talking about of debt. And normally when somebody or some business goes broke <clears throat> and they work their way out of their debt, and a lot of it is forgiven in one way or another, there's a business plan that says, here is how we will move forward so that we don't have to go into debt again. What I don't see here this morning is any indication that somebody thinks that relieving debt will actually solve the problem. So I'd like to know, would you accept the notion that country by country, for example, Zimbabwe, I wouldn't uh, relieve their debt because the leadership there is going to take it right back down in the hole, I would think. So perhaps one of you would comment on that. Well, thank you very much. I, I totally agree with your views on Zimbabwe. Um, <laughs> there must not be an assumption that the debt crisis has come about largely because of corruption in developing countries. Yes, corruption has contributed to the crisis. Yes, we agree that in some of our state houses we have got thugs and criminals that are, have been responsible for negotiating loans and so on and uh, ending up using those resources to buy whiskey for state house. Yes, we agree that also our own governments have not been accountable. They have tr you know, operated in secrecy without much consultation, co consultation in terms of um, their relationship with their citizens. But this problem goes beyond what the conditions that are prevail, prevailing at the moment within our own countries. This problem is also to do with the history of you know, trade relations that we've had. It has also to do with the kind of economic models that we are implementing and promoting. Um, financial systems that are currently in place. So when we interrogate this and ask the question that we should be asking, right, it's a very important question to ask. If we cancel effect debt cancellation now, will that mean that is the end of the problem? No. Because what we're saying is beyond that, we're also very unsatisfied with the current trade regimes that exist, with the current relationships, economic relationships that exist that makes us exporters of raw material and, and, and we, 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 we've not been able to process our raw materials and 
to the advantage of industries and multi -co multinational corporations that are in developing countries. So those are important questions to raise. We need to revisit the question of how do we revamp the whole system so that we begin to talk about just and fair trade. And at the moment, you know, we have lots of uh, deficient systems that needs to be interrogated and transformed. Can, can I just add that uh, I think people have got to be involved in this process. People in this country, people in, in my country, because uh, unless we people are involved no, and, and say their peace, we cannot just leave it to uh, officials to do this. Uh, to me, in the end, that, that is the best guarantee, that uh, when we demand that things are done right by, our, by us, by, for our welfare, for our interests, for our needs, that that, that should be the guide you know, for uh, policies and, and programs. Then, uh, and, we, and we have to also uh, change the structures in our own uh, countries. But this is, we, we need to do this, and this is a process. It's not easy and it's not automatic, no. But I, I, with more awareness and uh, support from different groups and across countries, then we can reorder the way we relate to each other economically uh, and, and so on. If I, if I could just add one uh, brief thing. I think it is important to look at the record of, of what has already happened with debt relief to see what we're likely to see in the future. And if you look at, again, we, you know, we haven't seen enough debt relief. We've seen only partial relief. But that that has come has gone to the services that we are calling for it to go to. The IMF put out a report last year which showed that for the 27 countries that received some debt relief, that those same countries doubled their poverty reducing expenditures over a five year period from when they received the relief. And that they did not increase military spending. So what we're seeing is, a growing record that this works. And this doesn't work just because, you know, this is how it happens naturally. It works because when debt relief comes, and this is different country by country, but there are structures set up, there have been structures set up, um, especially places like Uganda, where there is a partnership. There is government, there is civil society, there's private sector that are looking at what, you know, these debt relief proceeds and then how we're used. And that is a sort of model that, that we're certainly promoting and that you know, I think more fundamentally, though, this is a question of roles for, for different countries and different organizations. So our role as Jubilee USA, because we have influence with our government, with the IMF and World Bank, is to advocate for debt cancellation. And then I think we must support um, organizations like Jonas and Ana Maria's who are struggling very hard to hold their own governments accountable. And that ultimately, if we can provide them with support, it is they that must lead the struggle for democracy and accountability in their own countries. Pat Rumor, City Club member and also uh, an active Jubilee Oregon volunteer. And I want to, I just want to express a word of appreciation to the City Club for its support of this program and also access to the airwaves through OPB and the cable access. And I raise that and my question is to Neil as an activist here in a local community who has not been successful with others in getting coverage from the major newspaper, The Oregonian. Uh, if you have some advice and tips for those of us in the audience who care about this issue in terms of work in other city or ways we can get the major media, print media, to pay attention. Thank you. And thank you, Pat, uh, and for your modest self-introduction. <laughs> Pat, in fact, is the founder of Jubilee Oregon and, and an incredible, incredible leader in the national Jubilee campaign for, for more than six years. Um, I think the the, the challenge, there is a challenge to, to bring this issue to the airwaves. I think it's hard in general to get international issues like this to the attention of our media. But we have to try. We actually had some success um, last week. On Sunday, there was an editorial in the Seattle Post Intelligencer, which was um, quite good on this issue. Um, and I think, you know, the challenge is to really relate these issues and, 
you know, like I mentioned, I think that this isn't just an issue of international solidarity and that this is an issue of affecting us as well, that trade and globalization are affecting jobs here, the environment here. Um, you know, as borders, uh, at, you know, as, as international trade increases, the, the, you know, the pandemic of HIV AIDS is not, you know, it, it is a global problem and affects us all. Um, so I think the challenge is to make those connections and, and to really ensure um, that we're able to get this message out in, in different uh, media outlets across the country. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for our program. I want to thank our speakers once again. And thank you also to the World Affairs Council and Mercy Corps for co-sponsoring the program with us. We're adjourned. <laughs>